as you know, the purpose of the podcast is to connect people. And so everybody understands that we're all connected and that every religion, every culture is connected in some way. The first thing you said was, was the Hebrew scripture. So can, can we, can you talk a little bit about how the Hebrew scripture is connected to Christianity in, in a little bit more of a deep way and how, how Jesus, who you mentioned was a Jew, kind of forged Christianity and, and the, the significance of that in, I guess, in tandem with, with the Hebrew scriptures. So again, if we go back to the first words we talked about, if belief is part of how you structure a faith, then the, the reality for the Hebrew people, and I understand it, was a cultural, a uh, ethnical reality that was given shape through the stories and the traditions that were guided for many of them by the stories of Moses and the creation stories before that. So key figures in the Jewish tradition, tradition shaped how the Jewish community defined themselves. Uh, it was often uh, a genetic, uh, a nationalist understanding. Abraham, children of Abraham, Moses, followers of Moses, people of the covenant, circumcised, who followed the laws of Moses, all those came together into an identity, a Jewish identity. But that had to be explained. And at a certain point, it moved from an oral tradition to a written tradition, and that formed then the Hebrew scriptures. The scriptures have both historical parts, it have parts from prophets, and it has parts around the rituals of faith. So all of that Jewish tradition was pretty much focused around the area on the eastern shores of the Mediterranean. It did travel beyond that a bit, but the high point was seen in the land of Judea and the capital city of Jerusalem, associated with King David. And in that region and in that same part of the Mediterranean, the Jewish community to the north in Galilee was the place where Jesus was born and was raised. And so he was versed in those traditions. When he reached a point when he was entering into manhood, he met with the leaders in the temple and went through a process of being seen as a young Jewish man. When he entered his ministry, he went to the synagogue to begin preaching. So Jesus' message arose fully from the vocabulary and the stories of the Jewish scripture, but then it went one step further. It moved from a language of an identity shaped by the law alone to an identity now shaped by relationship with God and with one another that is marked by justice and marked by grace and marked by a present focus, not a future focus, um, not a contractual focus, but a, a focus that's more shaped by love. And that message moved the, the vocabulary of Jesus and his Jewish faith into a more universal language. So the Hebrew scriptures moved into this period of now a language that was acceptable to both Jewish and non-Jewish people, both wealthy land people and nobled people, as well as slaves and people that were outcasts. And what had been a regional faith now had the possibility and proved itself to become literally a global faith. You leave the comment about rejection and Jesus's rejection. Can you, can you further just explain why that was so significant in his life and, and in Christianity moving forward? Yeah, no one likes to be rejected. <laughs> no one likes to feel like something that is fundamental to them is treated as marginal or, um, can be dismissed and and that's a universal experience and when it involves matters of the faith more often than not rejection arises because a message has a significant degree of truth to it but that truth is unsettling that truth calls into question our own foundations it is not it is not problematic to speak back to a judge it is not problematic to speak back to a policeman or to a, a noble person. It is only problematic in that if your message challenges all judges, 
all police, all nobility, at that point your message becomes dangerous because now it is potentially asking questions about the very structure of power that you're confronting. And that was the reality Jesus faced. There were various structures of power around him. There were the structures of authority that were religious within the local temple, within the priesthood, that had relationships with the government that depended on those relationships for survival. There were also larger relationships between that area of Judea and the Roman Empire. This was not a, not a well-loved corner of the empire. And so by challenging the power of Rome on any level, you were going to be met with a heavy hand because it was important to keep the peace in that region. So Jesus' message challenged the primacy around one group's power. It was challenging the authority of the Caesar or the king, ultimately by saying there is someone higher, ultimately God. And it also challenged an understanding of life that was shaped by law alone, whether that was a political law or a ritual law. Jesus opened up a different language of vocabulary. And the immediate pushback was to silence. But as people have known, you know, Martin Luther King was put in jail. Uh, it was his 13th time to be put in jail when he wrote the letter from Birmingham. And the attempts by the police to constantly lock him away um, failed. But on that 13th time, he was put in solitary confinement. And he didn't have Ralph Abernathy and the others near him to talk with. And in that moment, he then tore, he had a piece of paper, he had a newspaper, and he began writing in the margins of that paper. And out of that attempt to silence him came one of the most powerful documents of the civil rights movement. In the same way, in Christ's message, in Jesus' message, he tried to offer this alternative understanding of power and humanity and grace. The reaction was to reject it, to silence him, but in so doing, it actually provided a form and an opportunity for his followers now to take that very same message universal. So it precipitated the growth and the spread of the faith, even as they tried to squelch it. And Jesus's followers, can you talk about who they were and just more in depth why they're, why they're important um, in the beginning of Christianity? So, and followers I try to use in a broad term. So we'll use different uh, vocabulary to distinguish who were the people around Jesus. And some of the depictions of who is around Jesus are shaped by the writers of those first descriptions, the gospel writers of the New Testament. So we hear mostly about disciples or male followers that Jesus called to be witnesses to what he was doing and teaching. This is a common practice, uh, wandering Jewish teachers. Think of it like a, 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 a remote learning opportunity through a university, <laughs> uh, very apropos for today. So in those days, there weren't places where you went. You simply found a person, a teacher, and you would follow them and learn from them. This goes back to the Platonic schools of Plato and Aristotle. For Jesus was a wandering rabbi talked, and certain people followed him. In that group were a wide range. There were, as far as we can tell, fairly uneducated fishermen. There was at least one tax collector who would have been a person despised by the Jewish population as working with the uh, Roman government. There was possibly a person that was a, a revolutionary or an anarchist. Uh, Simon the Zealot, uh, potentially was a person who would have engaged in acts of violence to try and stop Roman compliance, uh, Jewish compliance with the Romans. Now, having said that, we know there were women that also were in this group of followers and disciples. They're not identified in the same vocabulary in the scriptures, but the fact that they are named and uh, are lifted up in certain stories proves that they were a consistent source of support for Jesus' ministry. So these involved uh, Mary Magdalene, Mary Salome, Joanna. Um, they were women that followed, sometimes providing food, sometimes through their network provided places where Jesus and the disciples could stay. 
And they also were listening and they were learning and teaching. And the very first preacher in the Bible in the New Testament were women. Uh, the, the, the profound story of the resurrection was entrusted to women that they might be the ones to share that news with the world. The other group I would name as followers would have been those people that heard Jesus speak, that maybe saw him perform a miracle or somehow saw him in his life. And they would have carried that message back with them. And later on, as the church grew, they either would have remembered that and shared their stories, or they would have been receptive to others telling that same story. So you think of it in terms of concentric circles, an immediate group that followed Jesus closely and were trained and taught by him a secondary group that were the support team, the women, the men, the community members that helped him in his ministry. And then the third are simply the larger community, families, um, people of faith who took his message to heart and then shared it with their own families. That was, I think that was a good uh, explanation. It gave a good picture of who the followers is. Like you said, you most people think of the disciples as followers and there was it was a broad range of of people that were would have been would have been there 